Hi there, Pastor Adam here. Thank you so much for watching this sermon. This is my first Easter sermon here at Central Baptist Church, and it is titled, The Hope of Easter. It comes from John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. We had some technical difficulty, so the video is going to start around the seven-minute mark, but you can listen to the audio up until that point. And I pray that this sermon will guide you into a deeper understanding of the greatest news in the entire world, the gospel of Jesus Christ. We value the local church here at Central Baptist. And so while we are thrilled that you are streaming uh, this sermon, we also want to make sure that it never replaces your commitment to the local body of believers. So if you are in the Maysville area, I am personally inviting you to be a guest at one of our services. Come and join us. I promise that you will love it. You know, we're a church that is committed to loving God and to loving each other and to loving our world. So if God is using this to impact you and your life, please consider partnering with us in spreading the message of Jesus to everyone on the earth. I hope this sermon helps to fix your eyes on Jesus and drives you deeper into the gospel. God bless. Do you have a favorite Easter memory? You know, Easter's always been special in, in my, my family. I, I mean, every year my, my siblings and I would, would wake up on Easter Sunday morning and there would always be a, a basket filled with all kinds of, of different things. Sometimes there would be, be toys in there. Or there was always, oh, you know, the, the chocolate bunny. Anybody get a chocolate bunny today? Yeah, you always had, had the chocolate, chocolate bunny in there. And, and you know, my, my parents would, would always go out into the yard before church on Sunday morning and they would hide Easter eggs. We would all get our baskets and, and we would go out and around the yard and, and pick up the eggs and there was always really good candy inside of those eggs. So, But mom and dad, in order to bribe us to get dressed and ready for church, said we couldn't eat any candy until after church was, was over. And But as we, we grew older, we kind of grew out of hunting Easter eggs. You know, I don't remember what age that my parents quit uh, hiding the eggs, but I'm sure it's when it was no longer cool to run around our, our yard with, a, with an Easter basket. But my grandma, on the other hand, had no concept as to what was cool or not. She felt that no one was ever too old to hunt Easter eggs. <laughs> there was... <laughs> There was this one year in particular I, I remember that, and I, I believe I was, I think I was in college at the time, man. We went to Grandma and Grandpa's house after, after Easter Sunday service to have, have lunch over there, and, and I can remember we're, we're in, the, in the van dri driving, and we're, we're coming up to the, the driveway, and we see Grandma and Grandpa out, standing out in the front yard waiting for us to, to pull in. And as we got closer, I could see them. <laughs> These little bright Easter eggs laying out in the grass. My grandma was so excited. You could see this. Just, I mean, she was radiating. And I, I, I can imagine the disgust I saw on my face because I remember complaining to my mom. I said, you have got to be kidding me, Mom. I mean, we are teenagers here in Grandma expects us to take these baskets and to, to go around and to, to pick up Easter eggs like we're, we're five years old. And mom kind of did what mom does. And she said, she kind of laid on that guilt trip. She said, I know you don't want to do it, but do this for your grandma. It would mean so much to her if you in, in hunted these eggs. And so kind of just sucked it up. <laughs> we we got out, and she already had the baskets ready for us. And it wasn't even, you know, like the, the, the plastic. She had the, you know, the nice wicker basket, all the pastel colors. I mean, with the grass in it. And I mean, she did it up right. Because in her mind, this was the perfect Easter uh, celebration. And then she, she, she told us, all the kids, that, that instead of doing, uh, putting candy in the eggs this year, she had Grandpa go to the bank and get some money. <laughs> now... I was thinking that, you know, he got a couple rolls of dimes or something and put, you know, a cup of dimes and penny, maybe some nickels, a quarter if we were lucky in the, in the eggs. And, and then we just still kind of went out and, 
and I picked, remember picking up the egg, and, and before I got another one, I opened it up to see what was in there, and lo and behold, there was a dollar bill in that, <laughs> in that egg, and, and so then my brother and sister caught on, and we're all like, you know, going, going after the eggs, and, and then Grandma said, now make sure you go out and find the grand prize egg. Because there's a $20 bill in that egg. It was like Hunger Games from that point on, all right? I mean, we were, uh, I, mean, I would have army crawled in my Sunday best in the grass in order to find that $20 egg. <laughs> you know, what about, what about this Easter? Is this Easter unique for, for you in any way? You know, this Easter is, is a year of, of several firsts for, for the Burtons. It's our, our first year here in, first Easter here in Maysville. And it's our, our first Easter as a, a family of four. You know, Easter is a special day. You know, for some of you, this is one of the only times that, that you might come to, to church during the year. And many of us, we, we dress up nice for Easter so that we can look good in those, those family pictures. No, I mean, I even went out this week and got a, got a special shirt and, and, and tie because Easter is special. Now, sometimes in life, it, it can feel as though we are just going through the motions. You know, you wake up on Monday, you, you go to work, you come home, you eat dinner, you, you watch some TV, and you go to bed. Then you get up on Tuesday and... And you do the same thing over and over again. Day after day, week after week. And, and some of you have been doing this for decades. You know, it's, it's like you're, you're running on, on a treadmill. You're exerting energy, but you're not going anywhere. And at some point, we give up thinking that that the future is going to be any different than today. But Easter, Easter is a wake-up call. See, when we think about Easter, we remember that Jesus isn't dead. He is alive today because He has power over death. He has the power to make us fully alive in every area of our lives. If you have a Bible, would you turn with me to the book of John? John is kind of in the, the second half of, of the Bible. It's called the New Testament. And if you uh, find Matthew, you can go just four books to the right, and you'll end up in the last gospel, the gospel of, of John. We're going to be looking at John chapter 20 this morning. As you sit here in the pew this morning, this morning, how would you describe the, the meaning of, of Easter to, to somebody who, who doesn't know, has no comprehension of Easter or, or why we, we, we gather together on this, on this special day? I mean, do you, do you speak of Easter as the bunnies and the eggs and the special brunches and the, and the nice pastel color clothes? Or would you point others to the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, each of us here this morning, we, you provide a different perspective on, on life. For some of you, Easter is a day where you just you come to church, and it's special because you don't usually do it. You might be here because a family member asked you to, to come with them today. Some of you may be dealing with some real struggles maybe it's the the recent death of a loved one maybe you have some some pressing medical issues or you're just dealing with family drama anybody ever have family drama <laughs> for others though maybe life's going pretty good you know i mean you know it, it can always be be better but you don't really have a lot of of worries in life at at this moment regardless of where you are in life. How is it meaningful to you right now that Jesus has risen? 
I mean, one word that could, that could be used to, to sum up Easter is hope. Easter is about hope. The one hope that has held human beings across every continent and culture uh, together over 2,000 years in the face of every difficulty and hardship and suffering and death itself is that Jesus was dead, but now he is alive. Let us read this morning, John chapter 20, getting to verse 1, going through verse 10. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their home. One thing we notice in these verses is the amount of running that's going on. We see Mary Magdalene, she is running to go get Simon Peter and to, to the, the other disciple, who we know is the Apostle John, the author of this gospel. He decided to refer to himself in third person. And Peter and, and John, they were, they were running to, together, but, but John run, won the race to the tomb. Now, what makes it interesting here the fact that that Peter and John are running in the first place because in in first century Palestine grown men did not run it was uh, it was just out of character for a grown man to to run now why did John pass up Peter we don't know for sure maybe he was in maybe he's in better shape than Peter or maybe he had better a pair of, of running sandals or could be the fact that he was younger than than Peter. But when John reached the tomb first, we see that he hesitated and, and, and he only stuck his head in to look into the, the tomb. And, and he saw the, the empty tomb with the strips of linen lying there. Just like Mary, John didn't enter the tomb. Maybe it was because he was afraid. I don't know. But Peter, however, he shows no hesitation and, and he, he uh, plunges right into the darkness of that tomb. And in addition to the, the linen cloth, Peter sees the, the face cloth that was folded over by its, itself, indicating that, that somebody took the, the time to place it in a, a separate place so it would be noticed as it was neatly folded. We can see the, the different personalities and And these disciples and how they approached the tomb. I mean, John was, he was more cautious, only just sticking his head in. But Peter runs up on John and he barrels through into the empty tomb to see it for himself. You know, maybe it's because of the immense guilt that Peter faced. For it was only a few days prior that Thursday evening at the Last Supper, When Peter tells Jesus that I will follow you anywhere, even unto death. And Jesus looks at him and he said, Peter, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crow. And we know that, that Peter did indeed deny Jesus. 
So maybe it's the guilt that he felt. He had to see this for himself. I mean, if you were in this situation, I mean, what would be the first thing that would, would go through your mind? I mean, would you, you think like Mary, that, that somebody had stolen the body? Or, I mean, what would you do? Would you, you call the FBI to, to go out and to, to see who might have taken the, the corpse? Would you be cautious, afraid to go in? Like, John, maybe there's other people that are looking to take you as, as well. You know, the Bible tells us that, that John does eventually enter into the, the tomb. And when he enters in, Scripture tells us that he believed. See, for John, it was, it was that simple. It was a, a light bulb moment. I mean, it's like somebody just flipped on, on the switch for him. And from that point on, John firmly believed that Jesus was the Son of God. But for Mary and and for Peter, they weren't quite ready to accept that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead, just as he had predicted. Have you ever had that light bulb moment in your relationship with Jesus? Where you, you went from just hearing about Jesus to where you firmly believed that Jesus was the Son of God. That happened... To me, when I was eight years old, I went from just knowing who Jesus was in my, my head to believing that He is my Savior in my heart. You may be here this morning, and you, you do not believe. And that's okay. Because we see that it took a little bit longer for Mary and for for Peter to believe. But if you've, if you've had that light bulb moment, what changed for you? You know, when your heart is transformed by the gospel, what, what happened? Did your life change? I've got some, some friends that, who before becoming a, a, a Christian had various uh, addictions, and they, they tell me that after giving their life to Jesus, they had no desire to give into that temptation anymore. Now, it doesn't always happen to, to everyone this way. For some people, it is a lifelong battle to overcome addiction. However, for all followers of Christ, there is a heart transformation that takes place when you give your life to Christ. The Holy Spirit works inside of us so that what we once enjoy doing no longer has the appeal as it once did. Maybe it was you know, hanging out with that group of friends and, and partying on the weekends. It just doesn't do, you, do it for you anymore. And you find that you enjoy more coming to church and reading the Bible and going to Bible study and, and talking to others about Jesus. Who do you find that you're more like? Are you, are you like John who, who believed immediately? Or are you like Mary and Peter who just weren't ready? Continue on with me reading John 20 verses 11 through 18 now. 11 through 18. Read, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stopped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she did not know that it was Jesus. She said, Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. 
Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Why do you think that that Mary did not recognize Jesus? Now, there are several Marys in in, in the Bible, and Mary was a a common name, as somewhat is is now. Now, this wasn't Mary, the mother of Jesus, It wasn't Mary, the sister of Martha. It wasn't Mary, the prostitute. This was Mary Magdalene. And this Mary is the same Mary that Jesus cast a demon out of. She loved Jesus dearly because he saved her when she was at her worst. At this moment, Mary wasn't She wasn't thinking clearly. I mean, she had just witnessed her friend die as an innocent man the night before, and and she had come to prepare his body for for burial. And he wasn't there. Now, she knew that Jesus had said he would rise from the dead, but, but in her heart, she just couldn't believe that it would happen. I mean, that is, though, Until Jesus said her name, Jesus spoke Mary's name, and tragedy turned to triumph. Jesus previously said that his sheep know his voice. When Jesus said Mary, she knew that it was him. Have you ever been in a situation where you where it was difficult for you to know that, that Jesus was with you. Maybe you've been in that, that really dark place of suffering and you wondered, is he really there with me? I mean, even though Mary didn't know Jesus at that moment, Jesus still knew Mary. <laughs> And even when we have trouble recognizing Jesus' presence in in those tough times, it it doesn't change the fact that he knows us inside and out. Jesus knows everything about us. How does that make you feel? The fact that, that Jesus knows you intimately, does that make you comfortable or uncomfortable? I mean, have you ever, ever wondered, you know, does, does anybody else know what I'm going through? I mean, can anybody relate to me? Jesus can. See, whatever that darkest point in your life, the greatest heartache that you have ever had, Jesus, he can sympathize with you. Because he has suffered so much greater than than we ever have or or ever will. But it's also unnerving to to know that Jesus knows us intimately. I mean, think about your deepest, darkest secret. The thing that you would be humiliated if anybody else found out. Jesus knows it. You can't hide anything from from Jesus. No matter how hard you try, no matter how far you run, you can't hide from Jesus. But there's good news. Because Jesus already knows your past, it means that nothing you've ever done is beyond his ability and willingness to forgive. Let me say that again. Because Jesus already knows your past, it means that nothing you've ever done is beyond his ability and willingness to forgive. Jesus loves you just as you are. But he loves you too much to let you stay that way. God wants to forgive you 
of your sins. He, and he extends his grace to you. Now, grace, it's, it's one of those words, we, we say it a lot in church, we sing about it, but we don't always know what it means. Grace is simply unmerited favor. God is, is giving you favor without you doing anything to earn it. You know, for some of us, it's, it's difficult to, to, to believe that, that God would grant us his favor because of what we have done in our past. It makes it hard to believe and to trust in the grace of God. But the thing is, that moment that, that you attach strings to, to grace, it ceases to be grace. And even though it's, it's hard for us to sometimes fully believe that God loves us where we are. Easter is a chance that, to remember that Jesus has fully paid the debt we owe because of our sin. Because he is alive, we can fully be alive. Read with me John chapter 20 verses 19 and 20. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his, and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Look how Jesus greeted the disciples. He said, peace be with you. The disciples were scared to death. And rightfully so. I mean, they were being hunted by the Jewish mob. And the man that they had followed for three years, they'd given up everything to follow, was just crucified and they didn't know what to do. So they locked themselves up in a, in a room so that nobody could get in. What the disciples needed more than anything at that moment was peace. Is there any area in, in your life this morning where you need to, Jesus to speak peace? Now there are people in this room that are struggling with fear, with doubt, with anxiety. Jesus wants to bring peace into your life. You know, we're not told how Jesus entered the room that day. But we know that it was, it was locked. Because the disciples didn't want anybody to, to get in. I mean, if I could imagine what it's like. I, I wouldn't think it would be just like the chain. I bet there were bolts and, and numbers. I mean, if it were me, I would, you know, put the dresser above so that, that nobody's getting in at all. But Jesus found a way. No matter what walls might be standing in his way right now. Because he is alive, Jesus is still bringing peace. And my friends, that brings us hope for the future. Our musicians would go ahead and, and come forward, please. Just a moment. We're gonna we're gonna have an invitation. This is a a time for for you to respond to God and to His Word. And as we have this invitation, I want you to think about what situation in your life seems hopeless. How do you think Jesus wants to bring hope into that situation? For some of you, your life is far from peaceful. And it may be because you've never given your life to Jesus. If that's you, give your life to Him today. All you need to do is to repent and believe. 
Repent means to, to turn away from our sins, our wrongdoings, and to, and to turn to Jesus who offers you the forgiveness of your sins. You must also believe in Jesus. Not just in your head, but believe in your heart. Believe that He lived the perfect life. Died the death that you deserve and defeated death by rising from the dead. For others of you, you've given your life to, to Christ, but you still feel as though certain areas of your life are hopeless. How can you remind yourself in the middle of that situation that, that your hope isn't, isn't built on your current circumstances, but it's on the living Jesus? Never lose hope. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of this earth, they will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Lord, we, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that, that Jesus is the living hope of Easter. Just as he brought life from death in his own body, God, may he bring life and hope to our lives to the current situations that we are facing today. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Pastor Adam here again. Thank you so much for watching this sermon. It means so much to me that you would take the 30 or so minutes out of your day to allow me to share what God has laid on my heart to you. I would love to hear what you thought about it. You know, we live in a world of bad news, and at times it may feel as if there is no hope. But as a follower of Christ, I know this is not true because I have personally experienced hope that is found only in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Will you receive Jesus right now and trust in Him alone for forgiveness and eternal life? The Bible says that, that that's the only way to find peace with God. All you need to do is, is to admit your need, that you are a sinner in need of God's forgiveness. You need to be willing to, to turn from trusting in anything else for eternal life and to trust only in Christ. You need to believe that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross, that He came back to life from the grave, and, and that is your only way to heaven. And lastly, you need to receive Jesus' offer to forgive your sins, to come into your life as your Savior. If you are ready to believe, uh, go ahead to go to God in prayer. You can pray something like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for making it possible for me to find peace with God. Now I believe that when you died, you were paying the penalty for my sins. I now receive you into my life as my Savior, so that I can have forgiveness and never-ending life from God. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. Amen. If you just gave your life to Jesus, please let me know. You can reach out to me all over social media, or you can email me at adam at adamburton.net. Also, if you know anyone that needs prayer, or maybe you do, please call or text our prayer hotline. It's 305-707-PRAY. That's 305-707-7729. It's available 24 hours a day. God bless.